uh, welcome to the Wine and Chocolate Diet. We're here at Cellars of Sonoma with Heidi Barrett. And I just have one quick question for you, Heidi. Sure. So I'm just wondering if you are the intern featured in Bottle Shock. Oh, yes. People ask me that all the time. I'm actually not, but um, she is a fictitious character. The character of Sam, they completely made up for the movie, but she did base some of her um, some of her character a little bit on, on me a little bit just because I was a UC Davis, you know, intern at that time. I, di I didn't work for Chateau Montalena though. And also I met Bo maybe four years later. We started dating in 81. So in that movie, she's, she's a fictitious character. Yeah. Just made up to make it a little more fun movie. Got to have a love interest in a movie like that. Definitely you do. Well, yeah. thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, no it's something I've wondered about since I saw the movie. <laughs> it was a fun movie though, wasn't it? It was absolutely fabulous. Yeah. I really enjoyed it a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. We did too. We thought they did a great job with it. And I really enjoyed the whole project because both Bo and I got to work on the set. I, I worked on the set probably four different days and it was so much fun getting to meet all the actors. And really we were, you know, like I set up the whole Paris tasting and got to teach all the actors how to swirl and spit and, and do all of that. And, and Bo too, working with Alan Rickman was such a delight. And Bill Pullman, they're such nice guys, really down to earth and really a, a lot of fun to be part of that. It was great. It was a really inspiring movie for me, and I really enjoyed it, as well as it was um, entertaining, too. Definitely yeah. got a lot of laughs out yeah, of it. <laughs> definitely a lot of laughs, and so yeah. positive for the wine business in general. You know, just all, all good things, just all about wine, which was fun, and a true American wine story. It's really one of our, you know, few true historical wine events that really propelled the California wine industry based on that tasting that was a little over 30 years ago. So. It was pretty neat to have that made into a movie, and it's about my family. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So um, the when the Chardonnay turns the turns red, turns brown. In turns the movie. brown. Yeah. Yes. Did that did actually that happen? Actually, did happen. It's kind of a rare phenomenon. We learned it about it at UC Davis. I remember the professor telling us about it, and it's actually called pinking. So the wine, it's sort of the opposite of oxidation. It's when the reaction swings the other direction. When wine is kept so pure and perfect without any air, um, it can happen and it, and it can actually turn pink. In the movie, they showed it a little more coffee colored. It was pretty dark, um, but the real color is sort of a pinkish coppery cast, basically. And it did happen to that wine that, that won the Paris tasting. But in reality, it happened way ahead of the Paris tasting because that was the 73 Chardonnay and it would have been bottled in 74. The next year, it pinked right after bottling and it stayed pink for about six weeks. In the movie, of course, fast forward two years later, they had it to be a little more suspenseful, um, browning right before the event and it turned back in two days because it's a you have two hours to tell a story and it's more suspenseful if it happens right ahead. But that is true, and that's sort of, you know, one of the things that that really did happen, just not quite in the exact timeline as, as how it showed in the movie, but it, but it happened. Yeah. So has uh, Bo ever had that happen again? No, they never have. No, it's very rare for that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great that it did happen and that it turned back. <laughs> I know, it's good that it turned yeah, back. Most yeah, most definitely. But also, that's a real compliment to their winemaking that they made it so perfectly, yeah. you know? So yeah. even though I'm sure it was um, devastating until it turned oh, back, you know, um, yeah. they should be really proud of themselves, yeah. I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a historical wine, really. And um, and it's quite an amazing story. So yeah, they're very proud of that. And plus, you think about then, that was like their, their entry wine. They were, it was not, it had been closed down the winery for prohibition for a number of years and it was they were just starting the business so they they didn't have you know deep pockets when they were trying to get that going so really devastating as it showed in the movie that wow that's it if we can't sell this wine we're dead meat and the dumping was actually they were going to sell it very cheap to a to a you know a wine shop for almost nothing just to get rid of it and then fortunately it turned back and, and they didn't. So it wasn't actually going to be dumped at the dump, but they were going to dump it to the market for, for really cheap. And fortunately, um, everything turned around and it worked out okay. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, it, it, it's along the same idea of what really happened. They just made it a little more Hollywood version for the movie. Well, thank you so much. I know I said one question and it kind of led into a little more. So thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome. Thanks. 
So, what I wanted to ask you was, you know, as a big figure of sort of the cult wine, you know, with Screaming Eagle and, you know, all the other big name cult wines, you know, La Sperina, I can come in here and taste anytime, pretty much, you know, they're open. So obviously you have enough of them to kind of go around um, for the most part. And they don't have everything open all the time, so depending on how many people are coming, they'll kind of alternate, you know, what wines are open at any, at any one time. They don't really have the Cabernet open ever, pretty much. They did special tonight because we were doing the online um, um, or video tasting, so people would have a chance to kind of hear what it is described at, because I, I don't make very much of that. It's only like 450 cases, so kind of save it mostly for our buyers and people that have been on our list for years. So they can either get it here or they can get it through our um, our mailing list, which is basically our, like a wine club, only there's no requirements. People that buy wine from us buy it because they want to, not because they have to. There's no set, you know, you have to take a certain amount. It's, it's not about that at all. It's only buy it if you love it, because we don't make very much. So. I guess the, the weird phenomenon for me about it was, um, you know, so what, what differentiates why something like Screaming Eagle gets this 10-year waiting list, you know, with millions of people, whereas Lost Barina, you can, you know, open it, and it isn't so that, have that same demand, even though you're the winemaker and everybody kind of knows your name and knows your style. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that because it's really about what kind of press you've gotten, and La Serena has been kind of a little sleeper project that I've kind of had going on the side all along. People that are that follow it, that know about it through word of mouth, love the wine, and the quality is quite similar, actually. The blend is very similar. It's just not as famous yet. It hasn't had big press. I don't submit it to get a lot of press, so it's a little bit more of a word of mouth kind of thing. Um, friends telling friends, it does win a lot of tastings and, you know, building up as people find out about it, but it just, you know, I haven't really submitted for, for big press like what happened with Screaming Eagle, got huge reviews from Robert Parker, you know, early on, and at that time, that was what could really propel wines. Now, not as much, you don't, you don't see that same impact from a couple of the top writers like we did 10 years ago. Now it's more about things like word of mouth, blogs, internet uh, promotion, things like that. More friends telling friends. It's more about um, really pedigree of wines, authenticity. People want what's real. Um, they don't want flash in the pan. They don't want some something that's, you know, a brand new out of the shoe wine that's unproven. And so I've got the track record. Proof is in the bottle. Um, it's just it's just not as famous yet, but it but it will be. I'm determined, you know, to do it. So. Well, I think the wines are tremendously good. I mean, I, I don't see why they wouldn't be more popular myself and more well-known, but I think it'll get out. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate your help. Thanks. Thanks for talking to us.